Welcome to Life Study of the Bible with Witness Lee, a program provided by Living Stream Ministry. Witness Lee emphasized the experience of Christ as life and the practical oneness of the believers. He was unbending in his conviction that God's goal is not narrow sectarianism, but the body of Christ. Through his messages in these life studies, he stressed the importance for us to grow in life and to function as Christians so that the body can build itself up. We're happy to bring you recorded portions from his ministry today, along with some of our own thoughts. And we welcome your comments and questions. You can reach us toll free at 888 Study. That's 888-543-3788. Now let's join today's program. In the Old Testament, we find the record of the deeds of many of the great and powerful men of God. Of all of these, perhaps none was more mighty and performed more miracles than the prophet Elijah. In a way, Elijah typifies and represents all of the prophets of the Old Testament, even appearing with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration when the Lord Jesus revealed his glory to some of the disciples. The first appearance of Elijah in the Bible is in 1 Kings 17, where he is called by Jehovah to confront the evil king Ahab, whose heart had been fully turned away from the God of Abraham to the idols of Jezebel, his wife. Bill Lawson has joined us as we fellowship uh, concerning the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 17, 18, and 19. Bill, surely one of the most intriguing figures of all of uh, Scripture, isn't he, this man Elijah? Right, Chris, especially you mentioned about the transfiguration. Just to consider that the Lord used Moses to represent the law and Elijah to represent all the prophets in the Old Testament. So that is quite a thing, that he would select Elijah out of all the prophets. I mean, he could have selected, right, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Mm -hmm. Ezekiel, Daniel. He could have chosen all of those, but he chose to use Elijah. So this portion today is quite significant. I think just about everyone has heard of Elijah and is familiar at least vaguely with Elijah. They know he was a you know, great man of the Old Testament, and God did miraculous things. We'll talk about a couple of those things today. Uh, but maybe they're hard-pressed to identify any of the mir- miracles of Elijah. When we come to First Kings chapter 17, let's set the background a little bit. This man, Ahab, had assumed the throne over the kingdom of Israel. His heart had been, as we said, completely turned away from uh, Jehovah, and he had really run after the idols of Baal and Asheroth, really the idols that Jezebel brought into Israel, hadn't he? Uh, Right. So Ahab was not a good king, not a proper representation of the nation of Israel. So Ahab was a real problem to the Lord. So the Lord had to raise up uh, Elijah Mm -hmm. to deal with Ahab, and the Lord did that uh, through different means. The Lord gives uh, Elijah this word and tells him to speak, and he does, and the rain ceases for three and a half years, and it brings in a famine. And uh, the Lord then leads Elijah into the wilderness by a brook, a small stream, and he instructs the ravens to bring him food and bread and meat every morning and every evening, and he is able to drink from the spring. And so the Lord keeps him in a special way during this difficult period of some years. And then eventually there's this confrontation that takes place, and everyone, I think, remembers this part now. And Elijah confronts Ahab and all of the prophets of the false gods, the idols, Baal and Asheroth, and they're all called into one place, and uh, an altar is there, and each makes a sacrifice, and Elijah challenges Ahab. Tell our listeners a little bit about this challenge. Uh, yeah, uh, here you have Elijah, you know, uh, challenging those gods and so on. Eventually, through the situation there with the offering, the sacrifice, filling the, you know, covering the uh, sacrifice with the water and then filling up the ditch, and eventually there's a challenge there that uh, the false gods, you know, would do something, you know, but nothing happened. So eventually, Elijah took that same sacrifice that they had, and he arranged the sacrifice, and then he caused the, uh, called out, you know, and caused the fire, of course, to come down from heaven, consume the sacrifice, consume the altar. And everybody cried out, Jehovah, he is God. <laughs> Jehovah, he is God. So that was a real confirmation that, that the Jehovah God is the genuine God. 
We even see Elijah referred to in many passages in the New Testament, uh, just to pick one because it talks specifically about this passage we're uh, dealing with today. In the book of James, chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man of like feeling with us, and he earnestly prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain on earth for three years and six months, and he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth sprouted forth with its fruit course, following this uh, challenge, this uh, you know battle between the false gods of Ahab and Jezebel and the vindication of the true God, uh, Jehovah, the God of Abraham, then Elijah speaks and the rains do come and the fruit returns to the land. And so uh, uh, clearly a man of great works and of great power. But as we will see as the program unfolds today, there's more to the story than just the great miracles of Elijah. Mm-hmm. And it becomes, I think, a very graphic illustration of what God's New Testament economy promises and offers uh, that may be surprising to many of our listeners. All right, well, let's join Witness Lee as we talk about Elijah and uh, uh, set this up in a very proper way. We come to you on the reign of Ahab over Israel. We have God's dealing with Ahab through Elijah, the prophet. God sent Elijah to see Ahab concerning the reigning because it was a great thing to set up the heaven and to open up the heaven. So he had a standing to contact Ahab who was the king of the head of the whole nation and the whole nation was suffering in the famine due to the shortage of rain. So now God sent Elijah Elijah challenged Ahab to have a test and prove who is the real God. Baal of the heathens or Jehovah of Israel. Ahab had to take the challenge. On the one party, the king with his kind of power. On the other part, Elijah himself. Among Camel. The challenging was going on there. They have, with all the people of Israel, 450 prophets of Baal, the top idol, and 400 prophets of Asherah. Altogether, 850 prophets offered a bullock to Baal and begging Baal to burn their offering by crying. They cry, and even by cutting themselves to the extent the blood gushed out of them under the marking of Elijah. Then Elijah, by himself alone, repairing the broken down altar of Jehovah, with twelve stones signifying the whole people of Israel of twelve tribes and Jehovah sending fire to consume the burn offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and to lick up the water that was in the trench. All the people seeing this, falling on their knees and saying, Jehovah, he is God. Elijah one day battle. You know, Bill, you read this passage, listen to the story of Elijah, you can't help but be impressed. I mean, he really had a spirit that was very bold. He challenges Ahab, and then he challenges even the the false gods of Ahab and, and really puts his God, our God, on the test. And, uh, and then his words there as he's calling down the fire are quite marvelous. He says, O Jehovah, answer me that this people may know that you, O Jehovah, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. And the fire of Jehovah fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. You can't help but be somewhat in awe of this man, Elijah. But as we will see shortly, that's not the whole story here, is it? No, we can use the word, it's awesome to see the power of the Lord manifested to this man, Elijah. And like I mentioned before, we like to be those kind of persons. 
we like the outward display there. Of course, this is, was to confirm the Jehovah as the, the genuine God. But as we go through our Christian life, many times we win some victories right. and, and, and the Lord gains us. But the Christian life is a long road. So we may have some victories we win at the beginning, but because we don't have the proper constitution of Christ, at the end of our Christian life, it may not be as pleasant as it was in the beginning. And as we look at Elijah, we'll realize that even though he had this outward power and so on, yet when it came to the real situation of a serious situation, he fled. And uh, instead of ones like Paul, who really stood fast and did not run away, or like Jonah, Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be like Paul. Here was um, Elijah now. This great miracle had taken place. The people had been uh, turned back. It was not the first miracle that Israel had witnessed. In fact, their whole history is is a history of God's miraculous deeds, sparing them, even bringing them out of Egypt and saving them from Pharaoh and uh, all the plagues on Egypt and their being spared and the Red Sea parting and the Pharaoh's army being swallowed up, but they're being uh, you know, saved out of that and then miraculously providing them food in the wilderness, on and on and on all the great miracles of the Old Testament. And still their heart was never really seems fixed on Jehovah. It's it's as if the miracles got them through for a short time, but those in and of themselves were not sufficient, were they, Bill, to really gain the people? No. We need the indwelling Christ to be everything to us, to do everything for us, instead of the outward things that we so naturally appreciate. Now we see uh, Ahab, he's been humiliated, he's been uh, defeated, his gods have been exposed as being false, and he goes to Jezebel, his wife, the evil one, and he tells her, uh, it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and all about how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. These were the prophets of Baal and Asheroth. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, The gods do so to me and even more if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like the life of one of them. And because he was afraid, he rose up and went away for his life. And now this really brings us to the point, what we don't want to miss as we look at and consider Elijah. And now Elijah is on the test, and he has been threatened by the powerful, the mighty Jezebel, and he is fearful even to the point of taking flight and running away to hide. And if you do, Bill, contrast that, as you mentioned, with the Apostle Paul, who was often threatened himself in the New Testament. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul said, For I am already being poured out, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. But the Lord stood with me and empowered me that through me the proclamation of the gospel might be fully accomplished and all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and will save me into his heavenly kingdom to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Quite a different spirit, not upon Paul, but within Paul. Let's join Witness Lee once more. Here you can see. Elijah being threatened by that evil woman, Ahab's wife. How come such a strong prophet, right after victory, how could he be so weak? He could set up the heaven, he could open up the heaven, he would call the fire to come down from heaven. Could you imagine when he heard the threatening of Jezebel? He escaped to the wilderness where he requested to die and said to Jehovah, it is enough. It's too much for me. He got threatened, he got disappointed to the uttermost. How could he be so weak? Now, I like to give you a comparison. You compare Elijah with Paul. Have you ever seen anything in Paul's life? that threatened him to escape. Nothing could threaten Paul. Paul is different from Elijah. Elijah once had the power of God upon him, but Paul has constantly, all the time, the triune God 
rout into him, constituting himself into Paul. You read Second Timothy four, when he was to be martyred, to be thrown away to the wild beast. He knew that, but Second Timothy tells us he was bold and he was happy and he was ready to be swallowed up by the beast. The Apostle Paul, he was from the top to the toe, constituted with God. He was not afraid of martyrdom. He took that as a chance to magnify Christ. Bill, here's the comparison. I jotted down what he said here. This impressed me. Elijah once had the power of God upon him, but Paul has constantly, all the time, the triune God wrought into him, constituting himself into Paul. Compare these two aspects of the Spirit. Yeah, this is quite interesting, Chris. In everything of the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would always come upon his people to empower them to do things. The mantle of Elijah, things like this, the power is upon his people to enable them to do things and carry out things. But when we come to the New Testament, God's principle changed. Now God, he wants to work himself into man in the principle of incarnation. So this is a big difference here. In Elijah, you have the type of the person who is outwardly powerful, prevailing, dynamic, trusting a lot in miracles, healings, and things like that, which sometimes the believers do experience these things. Mm -hmm. The problem is that these things can rob us of the indwelling Christ, the one who wants to enter into us in regeneration. He wants to constitute us. He wants to transform us. He wants to work himself into us, and he wants to conform us even to the image of Christ so that whatever situation we face, we do not run away like Elijah, but we have the boldness, we have the authority of God, so we are able to stand steadfast in that situation, even if you might look at the Lord Jesus himself, right? If you look in John chapter 18, when the Lord, he went forth to these Uh, authorities and soldiers to meet them who came to arrest him with boldness and said to them, whom do you seek? And uh, the Lord answered in a very bold way, Jesus the Nazarene, right? And uh, he said to them, I am. So he (laughs) was very bold. This same person that withstood those accusers and the ones who came to arrest him in Gethsemane, that person, in a short while after that, he was processed, right, on the cross. He became, in resurrection, the life-giving spirit, and he entered into them. And he also, of course, later we know, entered into Paul and emboldened Paul, and Paul grew in the Lord as the indwelling one who was dwelling within him. And Paul, even at the very end of his life, he could testify, Chris, right, before kings like Agrippa. I was not disobedient, yeah, King Agrippa, to the heavenly vision. vision. Wonderful. He was bold even in front of kings and authorities to declare boldly his stand for Christ. And, of course, you read the verses in Timothy. At the very end of his life when he was being martyred, he talked about magnifying Christ in his body when he was imprisoned in a terrible situation. And then he said, for to me... To live is Christ. So even at the very end of his life, he was constituted, he was saturated with this indwelling Christ within, and that gave him the boldness and the confidence, unlike Elijah. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I will be put to shame, but with all boldness as always, even now Christ will be magnified in my body, whether through life or through death. You know, early in his ministry, Bill, Paul performed a number of miracles. But it's interesting, by the end of his life, by the time we get to Timothy, what does he do when Timothy, his co-worker, this young co-worker he's caring for, has an ailment, rather than lay his hands on him and perform a, a healing miracle, he says, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. What happened to the mighty Paul? Was he reduced somehow in power? I would say he was refocused on the power of the indwelling Christ, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. At the beginning of his ministry, ones were healed by handkerchiefs that came into the possession of Paul. 
and also uh, other things. But eventually, toward the end of his ministry, the Lord's intention is to, I would use the word, Chris, wean us, W-E-E-N. The Lord wants to wean us from the outward objective miracles and healings and outward extravaganza, and he wants to bring us to a daily living of Christ, where Christ is even uh, expressed through us, Christ is even magnified in our body, so we could say like Paul, for to me, to live is Christ. My whole reason for living is to live out Christ. Wow. So eventually, the miracles and, and miraculous things, they waned. You know, they grew less and less because God's intention today is to work himself into his people. Let's go back to Witness Lee, Bill. Every day, every moment, the embodiment of God, our dear Lord Jesus Christ, is making his home in our heart, is constituting himself into our being. I like to have this study with you to show you. Forty kings, they were not just the people of Israel. They were put into a high position, the kings. If you read Samuel, the kings, Chronicles, you could see altogether 40 kings. Not one was careful in the enjoyment of the good land. You just look at them, you wonder why. But turn the story to yourself. The reality in the enjoyment of Christ is too low. We have not been so careful about our enjoying of Christ, even our attitude. What we say, what we do, what we are, our habit, our character, all are very much related to the enjoyment of Christ. Learn the lessons from the history in typology to be so watchful and careful in taking care of the enjoyment of Christ all the time. The Lord be merciful to us. Don't try to be today's Elijah. That doesn't mean much. But endeavor to be today's Paul. He declared, I have been crucified. Now it's no more I than live, but Christ lives in me. Bill, this is uh, just so striking, the contrast that we see here. Uh, all these kings, 40 kings who lived in a reckless way, in no regard for what the Lord had really done, the good land that they had possessed and what was before them, and they turned to all of these things. And in many ways, we really have to not just point fingers at them, we have to examine ourselves, don't we, and how we live relative to what is available to us in the New Testament economy. Mm -hmm. Right, Chris. Of course, the land, the good land there, is, we know is a picture of Christ, is all-inclusiveness for us to labor on. And God's intention is that we be all kings. Of course, kings means we have a particular portion of that land, and we can be uh, those kings there in the Old Testament, they were uh, given that land to enjoy to the uttermost, but of course, because of idolatry and things like that, they fell away. But this is just a type of our enjoyment today. The Lord wants us to reign in life, you know, as Paul says, to be kings, to enjoy Christ to such a point that nothing of idolatry or anything would cause us to lose our enjoyment of Christ. Bill, um, uh, quite a portion today, and maybe a look at Elijah different than uh, any of our listeners have, have seen before. I have to say for myself, I feel somewhat that way today. We've been uh, given another view, another glimpse, and really seen God's economy offered to us in a way that uh, is sober and, uh, and humbling, isn't it? Right. We know God's economy, again, is that Christ would become everything to us. Uh, that he would be worked into us, he would come into us, we would live by him, we would even magnify him, and eventually we would be a real testimony of him. Mm. And this is seen in, in the life of Paul. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we would uh, invite you to contact us, of course, to get these printed life study messages. This is a gem. Uh, I think uh, we've uh, 
had a real treat today to see this aspect of Elijah and what a window to view our portion in God's New Testament economy rather than desiring always to be those who are so powerful outwardly to have the constitution of Christ within is what's before us. And that is what is reinforced, I would say, on virtually every page of these Life Study messages. If you'd like to receive the printed volume, please call us toll-free, 1-888-LIFE-STUDY, 888-543-3788. For Bill Lawson, I'm Chris Wilde. Thanks so much for listening today. You've been listening to Life Study of the Bible with Witness Lee, produced by Living Stream Ministry. Witness Lee ministered the Word of God for over seven decades. Many consider these life studies as his seminal work, an exhaustive commentary on the entire Bible from the perspective of the believer's enjoyment and experience of God's divine life in Christ through the Spirit. If you'd like to find out more about Witness Lee, these life study messages, or any of the materials provided by Living Stream Ministry, please visit our website, lsm.org. That's lsm.org. You can also email us, radio at lsm.org, or call us toll-free, 1-888-LIFE-STUDY. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on social media or visit our website for more from Living Stream Ministries.